The first few years of the new millennium saw much change and transformation within the realms of Final Fantasy and its developer, formerly known as Squaresoft. Having ridden high through the late 1990s, breaking new ground and reaching new audiences on the PlayStation 1, with the successive releases of Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX, the move into the 2000s saw a lot of transition at Squaresoft, with financial losses, a merger with games publisher Enix, and indeed a change in the way that Final Fantasy games were made and played, all combining to make it a very unwieldy and transformational time to outside players and observers. So this is an interesting period of history for Final Fantasy fans, and one worthy of discussion I think, because taking ourselves back to the halcyon days of 2003, the year of the merger, there was a lot of disgruntled players on forums and the like who lamented this business move, with many hailing it in the extremes as the end of Final Fantasy. This notion was bolstered in part by a couple of Final Fantasy releases that actually preceded the merger, but were regarded by some players as indicative of the direction of travel, namely 2001's Final Fantasy X, which, while it's generally well regarded today, it did usher in a huge number of consequential changes for the time that a vocal minority outrightly rejected. So 3D environments, voice acting, the absence of a world map, and each of these sorts of things sort of riled with a fan base that had been ushered into the series by the JRPG formulas and traditions of earlier games such as Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VII, and so on. Following Final Fantasy X, we saw the release of Final Fantasy XI, which to this day, along with the now considerably more popular Final Fantasy XIV, was always questioned for being given a mainline numerical title when it was a comparatively different genre as an MMO rather than a traditional JRPG for which the Final Fantasy anthology was known. So again, for critics, this whiff of short-termism, using the reputable title of Final Fantasy as a means to generate interest in sales, rather than giving it some sort of spin-off designation. But regardless, these two titles elicited a strong reaction at the time, in the early 2000s, in both directions. Now, it's prudent to note that these weren't the only things occurring at Square, and another significant factor in Final Fantasy's gradual shift from old to new was series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi leaving the company, which was likewise ominously regarded by some as a death knell for the series. And indeed, even famous veterans of the series, like Nobuo Uematsu, voiced the opinion that perhaps the series should have ended were Sakaguchi not involved with it. More infamously regarding Sakaguchi's departure was the myth that has sprung up around his box office flop, which was the ill-fated movie Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, which did indeed cost Square millions, but it did not, as has often been rumoured, force them into the merger with Enix in order to save themselves from bankruptcy, and indeed the merger had been touted for quite a few years prior to this, which we will touch on shortly. And finally, one of the often quite vilified facilitators of change during this rocky period of Square's existence was the CFO turned president Yoichi Wada, who replaced the long-running president Hisashi Suzuki as head of the company in 2001 and forced through the merger with Enix in 2003. And again, there's a degree of unfounded mythology that springs up around Mr. Wada, with those suggesting that there was a coup from this finance guy to force out Suzuki, who was this through-and-through game design guy who had built his career at Sega before he joined Square. And this paints a very black-and-white picture of what actually transpires. But the facts do remain that, firstly, Yoichi Wada didn't have the same emotional or indeed historical attachment to the Final Fantasy IP. And indeed, he had been quoted as saying during his tenure that he really liked games such as Uncharted and, and wanted the the company to go in that sort of direction with its games. And he's also been quoted saying that he's he'd want to move away from the Final Fantasy series down the line, but it was an important revenue stream for the company. But at the same time, and in the defence of Mr. Wada, he did cut expenditure at a time when the company did need to cut expenditure, and ultimately it's quite a tough one uh, to judge from the outside. But as someone that values creative teams and agile inspiring work environments, and I do work in this field, a comparable field, so I can judge. I think that some of the transformations that Yoichi Wada made, creating these quite rigid, inflexible development pipelines for the for the creative and development teams, I think that was an overall negative. 
and looking back to the time and a lot of articles and interviews that date from the early 2000s, it does show how the job satisfaction at Square plummeted once he took control of the company. So that was part of the the WADA factor that led into the eventual merger too, and he was a huge advocate for the merger with Enix. So that's sort of the historical context for what was going on at the time. But now, coming to the merger itself, it's quite a weird one, uh, because the results of it do echo out even into the present day. And I think it's also often been misinterpreted for how much it did influence the company's fortunes. And as I say, how much it was or not a turning point for Final Fantasy in and of itself. Because actually, there's a fair case to suggest that the merger didn't actually do anything. And what I mean by this is that the business models of Squaresoft and Enix respectively don't really conflict, but nor do they necessarily align either since Squaresoft had always been a mostly in-house developer creating IPs such as Final Fantasy from scratch under one roof, while Enix had built its business more as a third-party publisher, initially by holding game development competitions, uh, with the prize being having your game published, uh, and, and they started doing that back in the 1980s, and thereafter they built the business through shopping out development projects or outrightly acquiring development houses, and much like Squaresoft, though by entirely different means, it became a rising star of the JRPG genre through its publishing of Chunsoft's Dragon Quest in the late 1980s, which it became an IP owner of uh, as a part of that deal. And as many of us know, Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest were like the two powerhouses uh, of JRPGs. So it begs the question of why did these radically different companies enter discussions to merge back in the 2000s, if it wasn't for this mythologised reason of Enix bailing out Square. And it does remain somewhat speculative, but looking to interviews at the time, the prevailing theories and the most viable theories seem to be that Enix wanted a foothold in the Western games market, which Squaresoft had been achieving with the success of its Final Fantasy games. And for Enix's part, they had a boatload of money which held the promise of expansion and more projects entering development as Squaresoft. Though as we now know, um, many at Squaresoft actually, including Hironobu Sakaguchi and including President Hisashi Suzuki, who later deemed the merger a complete failure, were really dubious about the merger with Enix and what it would actually mean for their freedoms and their creative development projects. So this context is interesting to observe today and look back on, because even though many of us, including myself, lived through it as as a Final Fantasy fan, I often forget what a tumultuous and controversial time that the Enix merger was. I forget about Squaresoft's prior business model, and that even today we are seeing the fruits of Wada's stewardship and the Enix merger play out in how Square now operates. For example, Wada's preoccupation with the Western games market and Enix's business of acquisitions saw the slightly left-field and relatively short-lived acquisition of EDOS, for example, where they became the IP holders of Tomb Raider, Hitman, and legacy titles such as Gex and the Legacy of Kane. And they've consistently worked to publish Western-styled action games such as Sleeping Dogs and Forspoken, for example. Now, Coming to the heart of the impact on the Final Fantasy series, it's interesting to consider here because yes, post-2000, the series irrevocably did change in numerous ways, some of which we've touched on here, but they started to serialise and sequelise the games. Director Yoshinori Katasi himself has aped the notion that they need to modernise and introduce Western gameplay mechanics to maintain interest and and build new audiences. And if you look at the release timeline post-2003, we've seen a shed load more spin-offs, mobile games, and franchises spring up, such as the compilation Final Fantasy VII, the Fabula Nova Chrysalis entries, and so on. And for those that grumbled that the newly merged company was rinsing Final Fantasy as a cash cow, looking back to shareholder meeting slides from the time, there is a grain of truth to that because Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest were, I quote, to quote the slides, to be exploited as the company's flagship games to buoy up Square Enix's ongoing revenue. Now, as for whether all of this was bad for Final Fantasy, firstly, that is down to the individual, and whether you're a turn-based purist that feels that the games went downhill after Final Fantasy IX or X, or whether you're a fan of all the action-based stuff that came with Final Fantasy XV and beyond, that's obviously fine, uh, and your opinions are valid, but... For my two cents worth, and again, uh, someone who's looked back to the articles and interviews and shareholder statements of the time, and also as someone who's worked in creative departments at large merging companies in the past, I would suggest there are two things that have impacted 
how Final Fantasy games are made today. Firstly, I would say most broadly that Square Enix's business of acquisitions mixing in with the Western games market, mixing into amusement arcade markets with the acquisition of Taito, has spread the company way too thin. I think they've tried moving simultaneously in all different directions, with MMOs and mobile games and all of this sorts of thing, that at a high level has reduced company focus on what they already have and what they traditionally do well with the Squaresoft team and Final Fantasy specifically. And I think at a narrower level, this meant that we got a bunch of Final Fantasy IP games, like mobile games and stuff, in the early 2000s, which traded on the brand name, but arguably didn't have the same heart and effort put into them, and thus diluted the importance of the Final Fantasy brand name. But more importantly, and I think as Yuichi Wada rightly identified as costly, but went about fixing in entirely the wrong way, is the ways of working and development pipelines for Final Fantasy games, which time and again have been highlighted in interviews over the years as subpar working conditions at Square Enix. And honestly speaking, the development pipelines have never been ideal for Final Fantasy games, in part because Squaresoft was such an innovator in the arena of JRPGs. And what seems completely insane to me, even to this day, is that each Final Fantasy game, up until 13, was essentially built from scratch. There were no toolkits or game engines or asset libraries that the teams drew from. They just started from the ground up with each instalment. And quite a famous example of the inefficiencies there is when it came to remastering Final Fantasy VIII, they realised that they had lost half of the environments because nothing was ever stored in a master library. So the lacklustre feedback of that game being half finished is firstly on Square Enix for just forcing out an unfinished remaster to hit deadlines and again sort of boost revenue with the flagship title, but also on earlier practices at Squaresoft which you can sort of get away with as a smaller company, but obviously it still leaves these sorts of holes. And it is amazing that it was only by the time they got to Final Fantasy XIII that they built Crystal Tools uh, as a game engine, and later they built the Luminous engine for Final Fantasy XV. But what's even crazier, and again, it just shows the inefficiencies of the ways of working, is that aside from Final Fantasy XV and the tech demo Agony's Philosophy, I don't think anything has been built on the Luminous engine since. So again, it's just an example of this expenditure. You know, Square Enix is spending time building these single-use game engines, uh, and it's only now that we've arrived at Final Fantasy VII Remake that they have finally opted for an off-the-shelf product uh, by using the Unreal engine. So just crazy work practices all over the place that comes with being a big sort of behemoth of a company. And this certainly hasn't been helped by the siloed practices of, of splitting up creative teams in quite a rigid way. So personally, I I think Square is a company that has been through a prolonged period uh, of a bad patch, and I think it has dented faith in Final Fantasy to some degree, which certainly wasn't helped by the most recent president, uh, Matsudo, going off the deep end about blockchain and NFTs and stuff. But I do also think that the games are at a turning point, and the company is at a turning point, not least because Square Enix's new president, uh, Takashi Kiryu, has outlined basically the issues that I've raised here. Uh, He stated in one of his inaugural speeches that the company has relied far too much on foreign outsourcing and foreign publications, and he stated in the shareholder, in the most recent shareholder report, that he wants to invest internally in the creative teams that Square already has and allow them to once again be creative, have these cross-collaborative sort of work environments and make that a thing again, all in an effort to optimise and upskill the teams for their medium to long term projects. So again, taking that with a huge wheelbarrow of salt, because he is a CEO and it was a shareholder statement that is meant to soothe traders, but having a president who has at least identified where the problems are and suggests putting individual creativity back at the heart of their games development, I think that is a good start. And I don't know if anyone saw his speech uh, at the Final Fantasy 16 launch event. Uh, He delivered it in English. It was very encouraging, and he is a self-described lifelong Final Fantasy fan, now at the forefront of the company. And while I generally think that creative companies should have creative people at the top of them, I think the next best thing is having someone who identifies that creativity and creating memorable experience should be its priority.